Chapter One of An Exchange of Souls by Barry Payne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. An Exchange of Souls by Barry Payne. Chapter One. I met Daniel Myas first in the winter of 1905 at Hamilton's house in Paris. Hamilton married a French woman, and they lived in Paris for the greater part of the year. They were both terribly musical, and musicians of many nationalities came to the house. Conversation, on the days when Madame received, was tryingly polyglot for a plain Englishman like myself. As often happens at a first meeting, one received an impression which was in part erroneous and in part short of the truth. Until he spoke to me, I thought that Myas was a Frenchman. His necktie was aggressively French. It was bulgy and droopy and black silk. He used a little gesture. He had been speaking French to my hostess, and with a perfection that in an Englishman was almost unpatriotic. But he spoke English to me, and as only an Englishman can ever hope to speak it. It was not only a question of a perfect accent. He knew the latest phrases of the society in which he was moving. His talk with me was principally on the subject of the Paris restaurants. He seemed to have made a special study of the art of dining, and as a result of the experimental work, he had slightly sacrificed his figure. He gave me the impression that I had much to learn. He was rather under the medium height and powerfully built. His eye was vivacious, and his expression kindly. I noticed his hands particularly. They were rather too white and well-shaped. Just as I was leaving, I had a few words with my hostess about him. Madame was always amusing, but not always accurate. She told me that I had been talking to a great savant. No, he was not always so sweet-tempered as he appeared. For example, he always swore at his manicurist, but then he sent her sweets from Rumpelmeyer's to make up for it. If he interested me, would I not meet him at dinner there on the following Wednesday? It further appeared that somebody with a name like a tropical disease would be playing the cello. I accepted, and in this way began an acquaintance which I wish that I had never made. I say that deliberately. I liked Myas. I hope that this story will show that when he became my friend, I accepted the duties of friendship. But he led me into a track where I was mazed and lost. In the course of the next month I saw Myas frequently. He knew Paris well and showed me much that I had not seen before. He was generally interesting and sometimes astounding. One day he happened to speak with a flash of that temper which Madame had led me to expect of the extreme narrow-mindedness of medical men. "'Well, you are a medical man yourself, aren't you?' "'Oh, yes,' he said. "'As a matter of fact, I am an M.D. of London, and at one time had a practice, a beastly practice, in a beastly Somersetshire village.' but as soon as I was in a position to give it up, I did so, and that was two years ago. I came into some money on my father's death. "'I see,' I said. "'And as soon as you became independent, your interest in medical science ceased?' "'Goodness, no! You might almost say that was when it began.' It is that which has kept me wandering round the foreign hospitals for the last two years. Research is absolutely lovely work. As a rule, it leads to nothing. When it does lead to anything, you get punished for it. You think you have found out something. 
you send a communication to the scientific press, and you metaphorically get your head bashed for your pains by your distinguished and learned colleagues. But don't try to look as if you were interested in science. You can't be, you know. You belong to the leisured classes. Come along, and we will lunch at Ledoyen's. If I belong to the leisured classes, that is more my misfortune than my fault. I'll tell you all about that one of these days. What was your line of research, and who jumped on you? Somebody or other on the Lancet. I should imagine from the style and knowledge displayed that the office boy is allowed to do a little reviewing in his spare time. Well, well, it's a lesson to me. Never show children or fools half-finished work. There's no better proverb than that. He was by way of making a joke of it, but it was quite obvious that, in reality, he was very sore about it, and for this reason I did not press him further on the subject. It was my last day in Paris, and as we were smoking the post-luncheon cigarette, Myas asked me when we could meet again. "'Don't know. Soon, I hope. Do you ever come to London?' "'Of course. Everybody does. I am not quite sure, but I think my work will send me there in the spring.' We arranged that he should come to see me then at my little flat in St. James's Place. "'And by that time,' he said, "'I may be able to answer you more explicitly about my work.' "'Quite likely,' I said. So far, of course, he had not answered me at all. The day after my return to London, I happened to meet at the club an old friend of mine, Dr. Habedin. He is a mighty physician, with a right to put a decoration on his evening coat on suitable occasions. I asked him if by any chance he knew a Dr. Myas. "'Daniel Myas?' "'That's him.' I said, with the usual disregard of grammar. "'Yes, I know of him. As a student he did rather brilliantly. Got a resident appointment at his hospital. Quarreled with everybody about everything and had to go. Then he bought himself a practice, and that was how I came across him. He brought a patient up from Somersetshire to see me. I don't mind telling you that he was a devilish difficult case, and I found that Myas had diagnosed it correctly and treated it correctly. Did the patient recover? No, died. But that's got nothing to do with it. He impressed me at the time as a very able man, quite beyond the run of the ordinary general practitioner. He's given up practice and taken up research now, and he's gone absolutely off the lines. You should see the kind of stuff that he's been writing. A ghoulish business, I call it. Ghoulish? How do you mean? What is it he does? Dr. Daniel Myas is making a special investigation of the moment of death. You understand? He makes observations of dying people. When the thing is practically over and a decent man would go away, down swoops Myas with his ophthalmoscope and his electrocardiograph and all the rest of his bag of tricks like a scientific vulture. I should suppose he's watched more deaths than any man living. Does his work abroad, principally. And if the truth's told, he has tried some rum-funny experiments, too, things that would never be tolerated in any hospital this side of the channel. I met him in Paris, you know, just the other day. He didn't tell me that he was interested in death, and I should have said he was much more interested in his dinner. In fact, he didn't impress me as a ghoul at all. Oh, I don't say he's a ghoul in ordinary life. He probably wouldn't talk shop to you. It's the man's work that is ghoulish. 
I thought that science had declared all research to be good, and that in the sacred cause of truth nothing was to be considered horrible or disgusting. Yes, that may be so, if the research is directed to any useful end. But what good do you suppose Myas is doing? He is simply wasting time. We know what life is and what death is. Do we? I asked. I knew the question would irritate Dr. Habaden, and it did. If you think you're going to lure me into one of your profitless metaphysical discussions, you're mistaken, my friend. The medical man knows when life ends and death begins, and in the case of a patient who is past remedial aid, that is all he needs to know. There is plenty of good work to be done, and as Myas has the time and the means, he might just as well devote himself to it. What is the etiology of disseminated sclerosis? What's the morbid anatomy of paralysis agitans? That's the kind of thing he ought to be telling us. Cancer isn't settled yet. I could name fifty things that might employ him usefully. He prefers to worry the last moments of poor devils for whom neither he nor anybody else can do anything. It's sheer perversity, and I hate to see a man with his abilities so much misled. Well, I said, Myas will be coming to town in the spring, and I shall be seeing him. Shall I tell him what you think about him? Do. Mind, it won't be any news to him. He's been wrapped over the knuckles already. But I suppose he has some respect for my opinion, since he brought a patient to me, and I dare say he will believe that I am well disposed towards him. Very well, I said. I'll tell him, and it's my belief that it won't make a pin's head of difference to him. Oh, that's very likely, grunted Dr. Hobbiton and went on up to the billiard room. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of An Exchange of Souls by Barry Payne This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 I had expected that Myas would write beforehand to tell me when he would arrive but it was not his habit to do what was expected. He called on me at my flat one morning early in the following March. He had already been in London some days, and said that he had got his work in Paris finished sooner than he had expected. At least, finished is not the word. I had gone as far as I could safely go there. There are some very brilliant gentlemen in Paris, and they have an inquiring turn of mind. He still wore flowing and abominable neckties, and his silk hat had a perfectly flat brim. In fact, as I observed to him, he looked more like a French charlatan than an English gentleman. Possibly, he said, quite unperturbed, I am thankful to say that I am neither. He was energetic and vivacious and there was a distinct note of triumph in his talk. When I asked him what he was so pleased about, he became vague in his expressions, and said that things had gone rather well with him in Paris. Then he changed the subject and began talking about the Hamiltons. They had received a serious blow. The Italian gentleman who played the cello like an angel had been shown to be a trigamist, Morals had triumphed over music, and the Hamiltons had blotted him out. They had now gone to Rome for Easter, he told me. He refused to stay at my little flat. He said that his plans were too undecided, and his temperament was too erratic, and that he did not wish to make himself a perfect nuisance. But, he said, I will come and feed, if you like. Food is the one subject to which you have given any serious study. That statement, by the way, is, as I told him, a grotesque untruth. 
I took him off to the club with me and gave him a quite simple and unpretentious luncheon. He was pleased to be enthusiastic about it, and I told him that he was making a deal of unnecessary and unseemly cackle. "'Don't say that,' he said. "'I know what the enthusiasm of your life is. You are not one of the illogical and nervous weaklings who are ashamed to eat and drink.' are there such people of course there are they're a feature of the age they browse on breakfast cereals and drink ginger beer the way the consumption of alcohol is decreasing in this country is perfectly appalling he paused to take a cup of black coffee he refused the liqueur and proceeded i have dined out a few times since i have been over here and I have noticed things. One of the best wines is never drunk at all. It is always offered, apparently as a kind of ritual, and always refused. Although dinners have been made very much shorter, most women and some men refuse the joint. Dinner is becoming a farce. The really tragic thing about it is that these dyspeptic duffers seem to have the idea that their physical incapacity makes for refinement and mental improvement. It does nothing of the sort. Food for the body is food for the mind. The two are inseparably associated. Tell me now, what period in English history produced the finest men? the finest statesmen, generals, admirals, artists. Well, I'm not an historian, but I suppose there is no dispute about that. Roughly speaking, the period would be the latter part of the 18th and the early part of the 19th centuries. Of course. And that was a hardy age. It was an age of beef and beer and it was also an age of courage and inventions, which is precisely what one would have expected. Pitt drank his two bottles of port, went into the House of Commons, and spoke magnificently. There was oratory in those days, and there was consequent enthusiasm. The modern member of Parliament sips barley water and stutters statistics, mostly wrong, and national enthusiasm is at a low ebb, which is also what one would expect. "'I wonder if there is anything in all this,' I said. "'It can hardly be otherwise. After all, the stomach is the one fundamental thing. It exists in the very lowest organisms, which have neither limbs nor brain. It is practically the first part of a man to get into working order.' Its function is correct before the baby can speak or walk or coordinate his movements. In fact, if I wanted to determine the ego, I might be more likely to find the clue in the stomach than in the brain. Look here, I said. What on earth do you mean by determining the ego? Well, in what does your self consist? You would probably tell me that it consists in the association of your mind and your body. Now does it? When the mind has practically vanished, and no longer suffices even for a man's simplest needs, his life is still carefully preserved in an asylum. This would not be the case if it were not believed that the man's self was still there. When the man's body is dead and has decomposed, it is held by all religious people that the man's self still persists, that his personality is continued in another world. And perhaps science has rather more to say for this view than most men of science are aware. All of which is abominably dull talk after luncheon, isn't it? Not to me, I said. I have been getting rather interested in your work lately. You flatter me, and what do you know about it anyhow? I know what that great and good man Dr. Habiton has told me. Dr. Habiton is a perfectly sound man in his own line, which is rather a terrific thing to be. 
it is quite detrimental to a sense of proportion. He sees a few blades of grass, and he misses the landscape. I suppose my distinguished and learned colleague damned me as usual? Oh, yes, damned you very heartily, and told me to tell you so. Why? He thinks you are a man of great ability, wasting your time out of perversity. He says you ought to be studying the etiology of insanity, or the cure of cancer, or some other problem which really does need solution. He also suggests that you worry the last moments of dying patients when they ought to be left at peace. Seems to have been saying a lot of sweet things about me, said Myas grimly. Well, I needn't bother you with it. It's not your business. You belong to the leisured classes. You accused me of that before. It is true that I have no profession, and the only profession I ever wanted to have was not medical. But all the same, I— Hold on, said Myas. What was it you wanted to go in for? Army. The doctors wouldn't pass me. Ten years ago my people tried to get me to go into Parliament, but I had no ambitions that way. Still, I've got lots of friends, and I'm keen on lots of things, and I do occasionally think. Of course, I don't know what your work is, but if it lies in the direction of the determination of self... That is precisely it then it must be very interesting. Every man who thinks at all must ask himself sometimes, what am I? And he has not got the answer. Look here, you should ask my esteemed colleague Dr. Habit in that. Put it in another form and ask him what life and death are. I did, I said, and he was pretty sick about it. He said that he knew when life ended and death began, and that was all we needed to know. Well, I deny that. I say there is no limit to what we need to know. I say, too, that the very first things which we need to know are the great elemental things. Let me know exactly in what self consists. Let me be able to isolate self from its usual concomitants of mind and body, by which alone it has hitherto been cognizable. To isolate the self is to add to the dignity of humanity. It is to exhibit humanity with the sources of all human frailty left out. You must surely see that this is fine work. If I can do that, then all the minor points about which Habitin is so desperately anxious, will be added into it. It seems to me that he wants me to begin at the wrong end of the stick. He calls my attention to details of more or less importance when I am looking for first principles. Let me understand you, I said. It comes to this. You are trying to comprehend, to capture, to isolate, the human soul. Myas glanced at his watch. He shrugged his shoulders. That is the theologian's name for it, he said. Names matter much less than facts. I've got my appointment at the hospital, and I must be off now. But if you are really interested, we can discuss the matter later, and I can tell you how the thing goes. Do, I said. I want to hear about it. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of An Exchange of Souls by Barry Payne This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 For a fortnight I did not see Dr. Myas and heard nothing from him. I had not got his address, or I should certainly have written to him. I was extremely annoyed about it, and not merely because his neglect seemed to me unfriendly. He had promised to let me hear more of the very curious and interesting work on which he was engaged, and I was anxious to hear more. 
the matter had haunted my mind a good deal. I am not an erudite man, and I am not a philosopher, and I had been puzzled by a point on which neither the erudite nor the philosophical seemed to help me at all. I refer to the way the mind acts on the body and the body on the mind. A small piece of paper is placed in the hand of a man who has been hypnotized, and he is told that this will produce a blister. The blister does actually appear, but it is mind and not a piece of paper which has caused it. Every doctor knows how important in some cases the mental attitude of a patient is. With a fixed determination to recover, and a belief that he will recover, recovery does take place. Without this determination and belief, the man sinks and dies. The whole secret of the occasional successes of Christian science lies here. It is as true that body acts on mind. A certain state of the liver produces unfounded melancholy. A certain state of the lungs produces an equally unfounded hope, the characteristic space tisica. The hypodermic injection of a drug produces the full feeling of happiness. Everybody knows these things, but so far as I had found, no satisfactory explanation of them. I asked a physiologist what was the connection between mind and body, and where was the bridge between them. He told me that they were not connected in any way, but merely associated much as the shadow is associated with the thing which casts the shadow. I put this view before a well-known metaphysician, a man who spoke of all practical science with gentle contempt. Yes, he said, that is about right, but which is the shadow? This was not very illuminative, but if, as Myas had confirmed, both mind and body were but concomitants of the soul and self, it was easy to see how through the soul the one might affect the other. A man at Knightsbridge, wishing to speak to a man in the city, does so through the telephone exchange. It seemed to me possible that the soul might constitute a somewhat similar exchange. It might receive from the body and convey to the mind, or it might receive from the mind and convey to the body. Of course, Myas had proved nothing. He had given me no details. He had narrated no special discovery of his which had led him to his conclusions. And there was one other point which made me cautious. Myas had already shown me, in the way in which he discussed the question of diet and in other conversations I had had with him, a distinct preference for the unaccepted view, and this preference was often a source of weakness. There is a type of mind which always falls in love with the minority, and suffers in consequence from that blindness to facts which is supposed to be incidental to those who fall in love. Still, I was intrigued. I wanted to hear what the man had to say. I wanted to go into the matter further. I hope that the above does not give any false impressions of myself. I am no profound student of such questions. I pretend to be no more than just an ordinary man of the world. But even to the most ordinary, it seems to me that such things must occasionally offer both an interest and a perplexity. It does not destroy one's interest in politics or in bridge. It does not spoil one's fondness for sport, or upset one's convictions as to the way a man should deport himself, but it does occur to the mind now and again at odd moments. Ordinary men like myself rarely speak of such things, it is true, for we talk mostly trivialities. But I fancy that most of us do sometimes think of such things. Consequently, I was rather glad as I was walking down Piccadilly one Monday afternoon, to hear behind me the deep and sonorous voice of Dr. Myas calling me by name. He looked more abominably French than ever. 
I shook hands with him and told him, I trust with cheerfulness, that he had treated me disgracefully, and that on the whole he had better go to the devil. "'My dear Compton,' said Myas, "'if I have treated you badly, it is only because other people have treated me much worse. You see before you a martyr to science, or rather to the men of science. A grievance occupies one's mind to the exclusion of everything else.' I confess that I had forgotten you, but I am glad to be reminded again. Now then, I am going as far as the fruit shop, and then across the parks, and you may just as well come with me. I shall not, I said. I am going on to Knightsbridge. But, as a matter of fact, I did go with him, as far as St. James's Park Station. At the fruit shop opposite the green park, he purchased roses and strawberries. I heard the address to which they were to be sent, and I told him that he ought to be ashamed of himself. "'You have an absolutely evil mind,' said Myas. She was by way of polishing my nails, and incidentally she polished off the whole of the first joint of my fingers with wash leather and pumice. If you like that kind of thing, I don't. It hurts. I swore, and she wept. Hence the strawberries. That's a very silly story, I said. I'd sooner hear who has been ill-treating you scientifically, and how. You remember that when I last left you, I was going to keep an appointment at the hospital with which I was, at one time, connected. I wanted to obtain there certain facilities for my experimental work. I was refused. At any rate, I was so hedged in with conditions and qualifications that the thing became impossible for me. I have tried other hospitals with a similar result. That is the way the scientific investigator is treated in this rotten country. All right, I said. If you don't like it, why don't you leave it? Who's stopping you? Skip back to Paris again. That hat of yours would feel a good deal more at home there, and so would your nostalgic necktie. No, said Myas decidedly. I am not going. Here they take no serious interest in my work, but in Paris they take just a little too much. Everything I do is watched. Inquiries are frequent. If I went back to Paris, some man would take advantage of my preliminary work and would possibly get to the goal before me. I wonder, Myas, that you have the cheek to talk like that. You were quite right when you told me that men of your profession were narrow-minded. You are a case in point. What on earth does it matter who makes a discovery, so long as the discovery is made? You are not a scientific martyr at all. You are only selfish and greedy. What do you say to that? I don't pretend to transcend human nature. If somebody managed to sneak your watch, you would not say that so long as somebody enjoyed the watch it didn't matter who it was you also would be selfish and greedy. But then I'm not posing as a scientific martyr. Hospitals are not established solely for research, and I have not the least doubt that you wanted something which was quite improper and illegitimate. I gathered from what your friend Habiton told me, He's no friend of mine. Damn him, anyhow. He was one of the men who wanted to put the drag on the wheel. Well, what are you going to do about it? Have you got a plan at all? I have a very definite plan. Some time ago I made the mistake of showing children and fools half-finished work. I think I told you about it. I published the results of some of my investigations and the deductions I had made from them. Really, I ought to have known my learned and distinguished colleagues better. I had broken the first commandment, 
which is that you shall make no new departure. You may continue work which has already been begun, and may make fresh discoveries in it, and be complimented and KCVO'd. But originality and imagination are the unforgivable sins. Very well, then. I shall publish nothing further at present. In spite of the hospitals, I have found a way by which I can continue my work here, and I intend to do it. But nothing more will be published until I can give an absolute demonstration of my determination of the ego. The fact which they can see and test must convince. When you spoke of this before, you said that mind and body were but the usual concomitants of self or soul, and that neither separately nor in association did they constitute self or soul. Something of the kind, said Myas. Extraordinary that you should have remembered it. Not at all. Now, if science had chosen to deny, say, the existence of sheep, I can understand that you could produce the sheep and demonstrate it. But I do not see how you are to demonstrate the existence of the human soul. Don't you? I have given up explaining my work now. I will be judged by results. And I tell you this definitely. Before this year is out, I will demonstrate the existence of the soul to you personally. If you mean that seriously, I'm quite content. I do. And here, by the way, is my station. Before we separated, I asked him for his address. I was not quite sure which of our hotels could reach the high standard of luxury that Myas had habitually demanded. Myas smiled whimsically. I am living at 121 Knox Street. Know it? Oh, probably, but I don't recall it for the moment. It is a back street in the Wallam Green neighborhood. I said sardonically that he seemed determined to be right in the center of things, and that I hoped he was comfortable. The place suits my purposes. I have four rooms over a little shop that sells newspapers and tobacco, and I have made them a little more possible than they were when I took them. The shop is kept by a widow, Mrs. Laid, and her daughter, and they wait on me, so far as a man of my simple habits requires any attendance at all. I was astonished, of course. The best hotels of Paris had struggled in vain to be good enough for Dr. Myas. He had pointed out their defects to courteous and long-suffering managers. I had never known a man who required more attendance or was more particular as to the character of it. And now he had taken lodgings in a back street in Fulham, with a windowed tobacconist to wait on him. I supposed it was some fantastic whim of his, and I do not encourage fantastic whims. People who try not to be like other people are very tiresome. As I was sure that Myas expected me to ask many questions about his extraordinary selection, I would not gratify him by asking any at all. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of an Exchange of Souls by Barry Payne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. CHAPTER Four. When I accepted Myas's invitation to dine with him at the Ritz a few days later, I did so with my eyes open. "'I ought to tell you,' his letter said, "'that I am bringing with me a Mr. Vulsame, a young surgeon who is in practice not far from here. He will be having a great treat, and I can remember that I once expressed agreement with your dictum that the young man who is having a great treat is always a great nuisance. Briefly, Vulsame, though he is useful to me, will not suit your fastidious taste. At the same time, I shrink from spending a whole evening with him by myself, and you can help me considerably if you will. 
I believe that under a highly conventional exterior you conceal some slight kindness of heart, or I would not venture to ask it. Do come and lend a hand with the beggar. I replied that I should be charmed. One meets so many bounders that one more or less does not greatly matter. Besides, I was interested in Myas. Myas himself was at his very best and perfectly delightful, but, frankly, it was rather an awful evening. Valsame had good looks, of rather a coarse and common kind, and his dress and manners were enough to make angels weep. He called me Sir previous to the champagne, and Old Cock afterwards. He bragged absurdly. Somewhere about nine o'clock, we got him to some stupid music hall, where he was particularly anxious to see that appalling abomination, a female impersonator. We came too late for this particular turn, at which he was very angry, and I was very pleased. His comments on women and life were distinctly Rabelaisian, and Myas had to get him to speak in a lower tone. Throughout the evening, Myas showed much tact in his management of the man. I think it was my good fortune to please Mr. Valsame. At any rate, he asked me to drop in some evening in a friendly way. I cordially accepted the invitation, and to make the thing more realistic, put his visiting card in my pocket. But it can hardly be necessary to say that it was not my intention to let the thing go any further. I fully expected that that night I was seeing Mr. Valsame for the last time. As it happened, I was destined to see him many times. Myas took him on to supper somewhere or other afterwards, but I thought I had done enough philanthropical work for one night and pleaded an engagement. During the whole evening Myas made no reference of any kind to his work, though he talked with a good deal of wit and acumen of most other subjects. I did not gather why he had taken lodgings in Fulham, nor why he was so desperately anxious to give this Mr. Volsame a great treat. However, it was none of my business, and I made no attempt to get any information. It was for him to make the next move, if he cared about it. One day in the following week, while I was at lunch in my rooms, the telephone bell went. My man, who attended to it, brought me word that Dr. Myers wished to speak to me. "'I said I would inquire if you were in,' the man added. He is a discreet fellow. I guessed, of course, that Myers was telephonic for Myas, and went to hear what he had to say. He told me that he was very much depressed and worried, and that it would do him good to see some normal and commonplace person like myself. Would I come and see his new rooms? As it happened, I had a blank afternoon, and I said that I would come with pleasure. I had never seen Myas depressed or worried, and I gathered that information was awaiting me. I told the driver of the taxicab to take me to Wallam Green. There I dismissed him and proceeded on foot in search of 121 Knox Street. I wanted to take a leisurely view of the neighborhood with which I was unfamiliar. Knox Street is dull and gray and narrow. It contains many shops, and most of them look as if they were on the verge of bankruptcy. Everything in the windows seemed to be offered at sacrificial prices and far under cost, and apparently trade was possible in the things that one generally throws away. Curious and obscene rags were being sold as second-hand clothing. Soiled and aged back numbers of magazines had a price put upon them. As long as you got a lot for a penny, it did not seem to much matter what you got. Each shop displayed notices of a familiar and even slangy character. "'Stop that cough!' shrieked the chemist. "'Here's a Sunday dinner for you,' cried the butcher. 
Mrs. Lade seemed to be doing rather better than some of her neighbors. She offered for sale many different things. The solid basis of the trade was apparently penny novelettes and woodbine cigarettes, but it also branched out into sweetmeats and mouth organs. There was no private door, and I entered the shop. Had I been dishonestly inclined, I might have snatched up a couple of mouth organs and made a bowl for it. Nobody was there to prevent me. But from behind a door, which was half a window with a red curtain over it, at the back of the shop, there came voices. The first voice was, I diagnosed correctly, the voice of a fat and elderly woman. "'It may be all right, and I expect it is all right, for you're a good girl, Alice. But what I say is that it don't look right, and sooner or later other people on the street will be bound to notice it. And if I was doing my duty, I shouldn't allow it to go on.' The second voice was much younger and rather plaintive. Despite a London accent, it was not unpleasant in quality. I'm sure he always treats me with respect, with most perfect respect. And why I should miss a chance of improving myself, I can't see. It's most kind of him. And I can tell you this, he's not a gentleman that will stand much interference, not from nobody. If you want to lose the rent, paid regular as it is. Setting up there for hours with him like that, said the fat voice indignantly. I don't call it. I thought the time had come to rap sharply on the floor with my umbrella. Through the red curtain door came Mrs. Lade. She looked a conscientious, kindly, rather worried woman. She was fat and moved slowly. With the fold of her gray apron, she concealed her red hands from the glance of the curious. Dr. Myas, I said. Were you wishful to see him? Yes, I said. That was the idea. I am Mr. Compton. Mrs. Lade opened the red curtain door again and called to an invisible Miss Lade. Gentlemen to see Dr. Myas. Just take him up, Alice, will you? Then she raised a flap on the counter and turned to me. "'If you'll step this way, sir.' I stepped that way, and behind the red curtain door I found a very beautiful girl. Her hair reminded me of the days in my extreme youth when I kept silkworms. It was just the color of the natural silk, and she had any amount of it. Her eyes were a grayish blue. Her face was well cut and delicate. When she saw an actual stranger and spoke with him, it was apparently her habit to blush slightly. She was rather above medium height, with a slight graceful figure. Her dress was plain and quiet. She took me up some rather dingy stairs and tapped at a door which had been newly painted. The deep voice of Myas bade us come in. Myas flung down the book that he was reading and shook hands with me. I noticed, by the way, that the book was Alice in Wonderland. I took one of his cigarettes and sat down to talk to him. "'Before we go any further,' I said, "'tell me how is our dear friend Mr. Valsame?' Myas grinned in a melancholy way. "'I managed him beautifully. I gave him supper.' I brought him back here in a taxicab. I kept him here for an hour and took him to his own place in another taxicab. And it was really not until he reached home that he was actually drunk. It seemed to me that he was rather nearer that blessed condition than I cared about most of the evening. No, I assure you, said Myas. Even when he got to his own home he was not incapable and he was very, very happy. Speaking seriously, I am awfully obliged to you for helping me with him. He's rather a useful man to me. Useful? How? Hadn't it occurred to you? 
I should have thought it would have been fairly obvious. I have still a little experimental work that I must do, and the hospitals refuse to give me the opportunities that I want. Volsame has a practice, quite a large practice, in a poor neighborhood. You see, he inspires no sense of shame, and people are sure that they can tell him everything. Frequently he has cases which are of interest to me and have a bearing on my work. When that happens, he lets me know, and I come in as Mr. Volsame's assistant. Mark you, I get none of the qualifications and conditions that the hospital wanted to lay down. As Mr. Volsame's assistant, I do just exactly as I think right. Naturally, I remunerate Mr. Volsame. I also, at times, think it expedient to remunerate the relatives of the patient. When I came here, my friend, I did not do it merely to surprise you. It was essential that I should be living and working in a poor neighborhood. With the expenditure of a very few sovereigns, I can get what I want. The relatives actually like it. It gives them so much money to spend on the funeral baked meats. "'You're a gruesome beast, Myas,' I said. "'If you're not careful, you'll make this place too hot to hold you, and Valsame's practice will go pop.' "'Very likely,' he said with indifference. "'At present I am being careful.' I looked around the room. The walls were newly papered in a flat tint. The furniture was all new, not strictly artistic, but fairly good and comfortable. "'You didn't find all these things here when you came, did you?' I asked. "'Lord, no. The rooms were empty. I went to Tottenham Court Road, gave them a rough idea of what I wanted and the price I would pay, and Tottenham Court Road did the rest. As long as the stuff was comfortable and none of the things had any pattern on them, I did not mind much.' "'What's your objection to pattern?' "'All pattern is an abomination. It annoys you because it is repeated. And then, where it has to stop because there is no more of the blessed curtain or wallpaper, it annoys you because it is not repeated. It reminds me too much of my fellow men, so many of them and all just alike. Now you, of course, would suffer patterns gladly.' I don't worry. I'm not particularly cracked about anything of that kind. Why should I enjoy patterns? The thing's obvious. Your one aim in life is to resemble as closely as possible every other man in the same position in life, and their aim is to resemble each other and you. Any one of you would sooner commit a murder than wear the wrong necktie. Not cracked? Of course you're cracked. And you're quite sane, I suppose. Absolutely, said Myas with conviction. Very well, then. How's that girl getting on with her lessons? Go to the devil, said Myas. And I suppose the girl can go to the devil as well? Myas smote the palm of one hand with the fist of the other. "'My word!' he said. "'How absolutely wrong you sordid and worldly people can get in your judgment. However, there is just this to be said for you. You live and learn. You'll get to know that girl better. Now then, let's speak of other things.'" End of chapter 4《ハッピー・オブ・エクスチェンジ・オブ・ソウズ》by Barry Payne。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five Look here, said Mize. You must see the rest of my bachelor establishment. He opened the folding doors at the end of the room. Here, for example, we observe my dining room furnished by Tottenham Court Road for thirty-five pounds, 
and looking exactly like a dining room which has been furnished by Tottenham Court Road for thirty-five pounds. "'What do you want a dining room for?' I said. "'You can't possibly feed here.' "'Can and do,' said Myas. I walked to the window, which opened down to the floor. From it an iron staircase led down to a narrow slip of ground, which was by way of being a garden. A gardener would call it a backyard. It was a weary, cat-haunted spot between high and blackened walls, but I noticed that there were two fine old mulberry trees in it. There was also a newly erected building looking somewhat like a studio. This was raised a little from the ground, with three steps up to the door of it. I asked Myas what it was. "'That's where I do my work. That door in the wall at the further end of the garden opens into Durnford Place. Durnford Place runs parallel to Knox Street, and I'm not quite sure whether Durnford Place is at the back of Knox Street or vice versa.' both i should imagine anyhow it's a very useful door for it enables me and incidentally my friends to get up to my rooms without going through mrs lade's part of the house when you come to see me again as i hope you will soon you must come in that way i've had a new lock fitted to it and i'll give you a latch key i pocketed the latch key and said that the confidence he showed in me was pleasing. "'What I shall do, of course, will be to let myself in and burgle your workroom. There I shall reap the fruit of your researches, anticipate your discoveries, and subsequently enjoy the fame which you wrongly suppose is coming to you.' "'You couldn't do it. You are far too much of a duffer at that kind of thing.' What you found inside the workroom would be incomprehensible to you. For that reason, I won't trouble you with a workroom at present. Could you be bothered to climb up more stairs in order to see the most absolutely ordinary bedroom that Tottenham Court Road has ever achieved? Certainly not. Well, there is one more thing you must see, just across the passage here. He opened a door. This is my kitchen, electric, as you observe. And does she cook here? No, idiot. The cooking which is done here I do myself. It was easy to believe this. Cooking was one of the things which he took seriously. He was doubtless acquainted with the practice as well as the theory of it. Well, I said, I confess that I don't see your game. I suppose you built that place in the garden. You have redecorated these rooms. You have put in electric light and heating and a telephone. You have filled them up with a lot of fair to middling furniture. Now in six months you'll be sick of this and will start off on your travels again. Do you suppose you'll ever see your money back? There is probably nobody on the face of the earth except yourself who wants to live over a tobacconist's shop in Knox Street? No, my practical friend, I don't suppose I shall see my money back. But I wanted to live here for reasons which I have already given you, and I had to make the place possible. But it is by no means certain that I shall be leaving in six months, and I might quite possibly remain here for the rest of my life. After all, living here is absurdly cheap. It cost me twenty times as much in Paris. Oh, yes, I am quite satisfied with what I've done, so far as expenditure is concerned. I wish I had nothing else to worry me. He seemed quite pleased with the electrical toys in his kitchen, and insisted on showing me how they worked, although I told him that he was talking like a man at an exhibition and becoming very wearisome. Then we went back into the sitting-room, and he rang the bell for tea. It was Miss Lade who brought the things in and arranged them on a low table by the fire. She did not look once at either of us. Maya stopped her as she was turning to go. 
do wait and pour out tea for us he said i want to present to you a great friend of mine mr compton she murmured something unintelligible and seemed a little in doubt whether she should shake hands i settled the question for her her hands did not look as if she did much rough work i believe it is said to be the test of a gentleman that he is at ease under all circumstances and in all society if this be the case i am emphatically not a gentleman at this extraordinary tea-party i was not at my ease at all i did my best but it was poor i wanted to talk to miss lade and not only because she was a very pretty girl and the only mutual ground that i could find on which we might meet was the mulberry trees in the garden at the time of the revolution french exiles came to london and there planted mulberry trees notably in st john's wood and to a lesser extent in fulham so i told her and i dare say it may be true i heard with great interest that the mulberries did actually ripen and i made her promise to send me some of them in due season she was certainly very shy but i should say appeared considerably less of a fool than i did she poured out tea very nicely myas said little and did not help a bit after a while things went more easily and i got her to talk about herself she spoke of a theatre to which myas had taken her she told me that at one time she had been very fond of lawn tennis but that she could not find time for it any longer she had a very pleasant voice and great simplicity two things which i have always especially admired she was absolutely free from affectation there was not the slightest attempt to make an impression of any kind i should think she was with us for about half an hour then she rose and said that her mother was going out and that she would have to attend to the shop i tried to help her as she was taking away the tea things but she would not let me do anything. Myas did not even attempt to do anything. He had sat back in his easy chair all the time and watched us through the smoke of his cigarette, as if we were doing an interesting scene in a play for his benefit. It was scandalous behavior. "'Well,' he said when she had gone. "'Leave her alone,' I said. Then he spoke with a good deal of emphasis almost with excitement look here my dear fellow you misunderstand this altogether i don't blame you for that you take the ordinary view and any other man of your blessed pattern would take the same i'll go further than that if you were in my position i should give you exactly the same advice that you have just given me but as it happens what you say is absolutely beside the point the things that you imagine are not concerned in the question in the least i'm not going to make love to that girl understand that definitely i told you over the telephone that i was worried and depressed and so i am and that girl is principally concerned in it but most emphatically not for the reason which you would suppose i'm no good at mysteries i said if the trouble is not what i think i don't pretend to understand what it is but i do profess to know something about human nature your intentions are excellent of course but in a case like this there is often a marked difference between a man's intentions and his conduct i will flatter you so far as to tell you that you're not an ordinary man still you're a human being admitted i do not profess to have lived the life of an anchorite hitherto but i am telling you the exact truth when i say that nothing exists now for me but my work and that this girl troubles me only in so far as she is connected with my work and if i do as i wish she will be very intimately connected with it oh very well i said but there's another thing to think about 
for the last half hour or so i have been watching that girl in here if she is not very much in love with you i'm mistaken and i know nothing myas seemed to reflect for a minute then he said with conviction i hope she is i hope to goodness she is if she is not she is not likely to be of much use to me i give it up i don't understand you no said myas but you will one of these days how how echoed myas well you will understand because either that girl or myself will give you the explanation as i rose to go i pressed him to come and see me some time he said that he would if he could but that he was very busy now and it was a long way to come it is i said but i should like to point out that the distance from knox street to st james's place is exactly the same as the distance from st james's place to knox street which distance i have covered this very afternoon he said that i was a man of leisure and that time distance and taxicabs were all as nothing to me i was to come again he generally knocked off work for an hour or two in the afternoon i had my latch key i left him with the uncomfortable feeling that i had been spending the afternoon with a friend of mine who was by way of being a blackguard i did not suppose that he was a typical deceiver and seducer but he did seem to me to be a man absolutely without scruple where his work was concerned i did not like his business with Valsame. i did not like the way he was treating alice Lade. what business had he to make use of her fondness for him for his own purposes that she was fond of him i had no doubt whatever she looked at me with candid and friendly eyes but when her eyes met his they became timorous and perturbed and the long lashes flickered the one saving grace of the man was that he was really worried about what he was doing if he was indeed without scruple it was with great difficulty that he had brought himself to that point about a month later i rang up myas on the telephone and suggested that i should come to see him that afternoon he replied that he was very sorry but that work which it was impossible to leave would occupy him the whole of that afternoon he would come to see me but he did not come to see me it was in june that i received from him a rather curious letter in which he announced his engagement to alice Lade. End of chapter 5chapter 6 of an exchange of souls by barry payne this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 6 myas said in his long letter that the news of his engagement would probably give me a comfortable feeling of superiority i having always known of course what would happen with this would be mingled a certain regret that he had not allied himself more advantageously from the world's point of view and both feelings he assured me would be quite out of place the fact is he wrote that it had become necessary for the purposes of my work for miss Lade and myself to be frequently together for long periods knox street shook its respectable head and mrs Lade did not like it the proclamation of an engagement and the purchase of an absurdly valuable ring have changed all this knox street smiles upon us and dreams confetti mrs Lade is quite happy briefly the engagement is simply the price we pay to knox street for permission to continue our work as before so if you have any impression that you ever foresaw anything you should correct it it is quite probable that we shall never be married but that depends to some extent on the result of my great experiment meanwhile as i require the whole of miss Lade's time 
I have provided a domestic substitute to Mrs. Lade's considerable but rather tremulous satisfaction. For her, Knox Street is the voice of society and almost the voice of God. It is a street filled with people who have kept themselves respectable. Think of all the poignant meaning of that phrase. With insufficient means for the purpose, and with countless temptations to be otherwise, these good people are still respectable. Beside their hard-won respectability, your own, facile and cultured, is no more than sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Mrs. Lade is tremulous because she has advanced one step up the ladder. There is a definite line of demarcation here between the people who keep a girl and the people who do it all themselves. Mrs. Lade naturally fears lest she should be thought guilty of that quality which the Greeks called hubris and Fulham calls swelled head. She therefore sighs and explains to her friends that it was all on account of the lodger and that she hopes it may be for the best. My work has gone on very rapidly, and the day is not far off now. I have little doubt that I shall be able to redeem a promise that I once made you. I wish you would come and see me tomorrow afternoon. It is too bad of you to have neglected me like this. The man was astounding. On looking into the matter, I found that I had made two appointments for the following afternoon. I had promised to go with the Hamiltons, who were in town for a few days, to the Queen's Hall, and I had also promised to play bridge with some other people. That made it all quite easy. I excused myself from the bridge party on the ground that I had forgotten about the Hamiltons, and from the Hamiltons on the ground that I had forgotten about the bridge party these two appointments being safely and easily cancelled i got into a taxicab and drove to durnford place i let myself in with the latch-key that myas had given me and went up the strip of garden as i passed the workroom i heard within a chink of glass and a light footstep i hesitated a moment thinking that myas might be there but I remembered that, when he showed me the rest of his establishment, he had rather made a point of not showing me the workroom. So I went on up the iron staircase and tapped at the window. Myas himself let me in. "'Come to deliver your congratulations?' he asked, rather sardonically. "'No, I've come to ask you to explain yourself.' but my dear fellow what is there to explain it all seems to me so simple and natural what do you mean by saying that it had become necessary for you and miss lade to be together for long periods the thing is absolute nonsense what possible use can she be to you in your work she has certainly had no scientific education she has probably had precious little education of any kind at this moment the door opened, and Miss Lade entered. She addressed herself to Myas, speaking eagerly and quickly. "'The variation is three seconds and two-fifths.' As she spoke she saw me. She greeted me cordially enough and shook hands, but instantly turned back again to Myas. "'Yes,' said Myas. "'That's too much, isn't it?' "'I thought—' she said, of trying again with ether alone. Yes, he said, you might certainly try that. Do. You'll be through with it by tea time. I expect so, she said, and went out of the room again. I think I have never before in my life experienced more completely the sensation that I did not matter in the least. I felt like a small boy who remains quiet and orderly while his superior papa and mamma discuss questions of finance or the morals of the parlor maid or anything else which is not for little boys in indifferent French. Let's see, said Myas. You were beginning to talk about education, weren't you? 
Sorry for the interruption. I've got views about education. Oh, you've got views on everything under the sun. The London season's telling on your nerves, Compton. You incline to be irritable. I do not think, speaking quite dispassionately, that Alice Lade is exactly what you would have expected from her parentage and position in life. Obviously she's not. I admit all that. It is true, as you say, that her education was of the very slightest. That was all the better from my point of view. I had no rubbish to clear away. Nothing on earth is quite so easy to understand as what is popularly called science. The only way that men have been able to make it all difficult is by inventing a very frantic terminology which they habitually mispronounce and by carefully suppressing all habits of simple and lucid speech. Education for the child means a march into the unknown. He is told that he has to do quadratic equations, but nobody ever dreams of telling him why. He has to know the name of the capital of Portugal. He has, in extreme cases, to know the names of the kings of Israel and Judah. The patience of the child is remarkable. He really does consent to lumber up his mind with all this nonsense, merely because Papa or the governess or the schoolmaster wishes him to do it. It is a wonderful thing that any horse consents to draw any cart, but it is still more wonderful that any child consents to acquire knowledge on the lines on which knowledge is now generally imparted. When you start on a journey, it is advisable to know where you're going, and you do not journey with much purpose or enthusiasm if you do not know it. One of the very first things I did with Miss Lade was to show her what I was aiming at, and how she could help. "'I see,' I said. "'You told her that you were aiming at the determination of the ego, and she understood all that at once.' naturally she would don't be an ass that was of course what i told her but equally of course those were not the words which i used i asked her what she was why she was here and what would happen when she died she told me that she was a girl that she was here to do her duty and that she would go to hell if she did not do it as soon as I began to show her how far from satisfactory these answers were, she became interested. These simple elemental things interest everybody, even you. We know, of course, very little about them at present, and the prospect that she and I would be able to discover more naturally attracted Alice. But I am not taking all the credit for my way of teaching. She is intelligent, plastic, receptive, to a very unusual degree. Many things she seems to acquire unconsciously. For instance, her talk. You noticed it? Yes, I noticed it. The London accent has been eliminated. Yes, she now talks just as you do. There you are wrong. It is your own accent which she has copied. There is the faintest possible foreign note in it, which has come to you, I suppose, from the fact that you have been speaking French for so long. How did you get her to acquire it? I did not. I have just told you that it was one of the things that she picked up unconsciously. I have never corrected her speech in any way. The fact of the case is that in some respects Alice is singularly childlike. If a child is given a nurse with a cockney accent, the child will soon talk cockney. If he has a French bonne, he will soon talk French. The influence of the person in authority with whom the child is on intimate terms always works, and always unconsciously. Well, now, my friend, suppose we look at this engagement from Miss Lade's point of view. Does she understand that the whole thing is merely a farce, and that you have no intention of carrying it out? 
but that is not the case you must have misunderstood something i said in my letter i have every intention of carrying it out if it is possible but the result of my experiment may make it impossible it all turns upon that i don't want to go into the question with you just now but i admit there is a very grave risk in the experiment and yet she is to take part in it well yes why not she wishes it she is absolutely devoted to me and for that reason alone she would do it and by this time she is quite as keen about the work as i am i own that i felt some reluctance at first i was worried and depressed about it as you remember i still feel that i should be wrong if i put any kind of compulsion upon her if for instance i told her that it was of supreme importance to me that she should take this risk but i have not done that and she is a free agent what she is going to do she has volunteered to do and mind she runs no risk which i shall not share equally with her that seems to me to make it all right don't you think so of course i don't it's all wrong it seems to me that what i ought to do is go downstairs and have ten minutes talk with the poor victim's mother you can have ten minutes or ten hours talk with mrs lade if you like it would make no difference she is not the dominant factor and alice is of course the consideration which you are leaving out in your own mind is really the consideration which best justifies me there is no advance without sacrifice and in this case the advance is tremendous and the sacrifice if it is needed is justified however the last thing i wish to do is to quarrel with you just now more particularly as i want to ask a favor of you i have just made my will don't for goodness sake say that you want me to be a trustee i am a trustee for three people already they all liked me once but they all hate me now and they're all convinced that if i were not a curious combination of knave and fool i could get them seven per cent out of trust securities well i do want you to be a trustee i am leaving everything in trust for miss lade i promise you that she will give you no trouble whatever you will find her perfectly reasonable and docile after some discussion i gave way and consented and then miss lade came in again from the workroom well said myas she shook her head no use at all worse than before and then she turned to talk to me certainly the change in her in a very short time was remarkable she was self-possessed and only blushed once when i congratulated her on her engagement it was easy to talk to her her voice was pleasant and musical and i thought her perfectly charming myas came down the garden with me when i left i said to him do you mean to tell me that you're not in love with her undoubtedly i shall be if all goes well at present there is too much to think about i haven't the time for love why i've never even kissed her if i were you i should go back now and do it believe me it doesn't take long it would be absolute ruin said myas end of chapter six Chapter Seven of An Exchange of Souls by Barry Peen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. During the next fortnight, I saw a good deal of Myas and Miss Lade, and got to know the latter much better. I did not go to Knox Street every afternoon. Myas asked me to do so, but I went very often one afternoon miss lade spoke with some interest of a forthcoming play 
This seemed to me to offer an opportunity, and I asked her if she and Myas would dine with me on the first night, and come with me to the theatre afterwards. "'I'm afraid I couldn't,' said Miss Laid. "'I have not got any evening dress, but it's very kind of you.' "'That kind of thing must come later,' said Myas. "'When we've finished our work, we'll come to you as often as you like.' "'Good.' I said. I'll tell the theater to postpone the production. Don't get angry with us, said Myas. At present, except for an hour or two in the afternoon, we are horribly unsociable. There is a kind of interest in life that shuts out all other interests. But the end will come soon now, won't it, Alice? Very soon, said Miss Lade. She was standing against the window, and the pure beauty of her profile was a delight to one's eyes. Suddenly she exclaimed with ecstasy, "'Carter Patterson! They've sent it at last!' "'Good!' exclaimed Myas, and flew down the stairs. Miss Lade turned to me rather apologetically. "'It is some apparatus,' she said. We have been kept waiting a long time for it. Scientific instrument makers seem to be the slowest people in the world. Myas came panting into the room with a large box in his arms. They did not unpack it completely, but they took out one or two pieces and fitted them together. Miss Lade's joy over the contents of the box was quite real and unaffected. I doubted if her first evening dress would give her so much pleasure. The more I saw of Miss Lade, the higher my opinion of her became. She had great abilities, but even so, her acquirements and her advance during the last few months seemed to me miraculous. She still kept that almost childlike simplicity, which from the first I had appreciated in her. Her devotion to Myas was obviously of the most exalted kind, and her enthusiasm in the work was not less than his own. I could understand now what he meant when he told me that it would be absolute ruin if he began to make love to her. Afterwards he would have been unable to continue his work, or to conduct any experiment in which the least risk to her was involved. Nature would have forced its way. Passion was not suppressed, but it was postponed. When the work was done, there would be dinners and evening dresses, and there would be time for love. I got an impression that she understood all this. One afternoon I returned to St. James's Place on the top of a motor omnibus. On the seat in front of me were two old women with strident voices. They were discussing Mr. Valsame. I wouldn't go to him, said one of them, and I wouldn't call him into my house, not if there wasn't another doctor in England. Bit too fond of lifting the elbow, eh? said the other. Yes, that's true enough, but that's not all. She became confidential and dropped her voice. I was not greatly surprised. I knew that Valsame drank and my curiosity as to what else he did was not very keen. It was at the end of this fortnight, in the middle of the London season, and with countless engagements on hand, that I gave the whole thing up and went away. It was a sudden and overmastering impulse, which had occurred to me before, and will probably occur to me again. To my friends and acquaintances, I suppose that I seem a normal and cheerful bachelor of forty. That, perhaps, is what I am most of the time. Still, I have been through things of a kind that leave their mark. I was quite a young man when the doctors cut me off from the only profession that I could ever have loved. They stopped polo and hunting as well. For a while I was a good deal of an invalid, and that, I dare say, was a sound enough reason for the girl who threw me over and married a better man. My health is fairly good now, and I do most of the right things at the right time. I enjoy the society of my fellow men, 
and I think I can hold my own in any of the sports that my health has left open to me. I am not broken-hearted, and I am not a sentimentalist, but occasionally I get a sudden revulsion against the kind of life that I am leading. Its pleasures become an unmitigated bore. Its absolute uselessness and selfishness disgust me. Then I remember that, but for a whim of fate, I might have been engaged in an active profession, and possibly doing some good in the world. Just at this time, too, I recalled the girl who broke her engagement with me. Alice Lade reminded me of her a little, and I was not in the least in love with Alice Lade, but yet I regarded Myas with envy. He had at any rate managed to make some woman care very much for him. My mood at such times is not cheerful, and there is no reason why I should ask my friends to put up with it. Besides, I have found that quiet and solitude are the best cure for it. That is why some years ago I bought for half nothing a little cottage far up on a hill in Gloucestershire, ten miles from the nearest railway station. When I find that solitude and the simplicity of life there no longer please me, my cure is complete. I can go back and mix with my fellow men again. I never take my valet down with me to the cottage. An elderly couple have the charge of it, and they can do all that I require. When I am down there, I want nothing that reminds me of London. I keep a small car and have learned to drive it. The distance from shops and the station make it a necessity. I have the fishing rights over three miles of river. If I ever needed it, I could get some golf but so far I have left it alone. I go down to my cottage to avoid my fellow men, not to mix with them. It may have been partly, perhaps, because I had seen so much lately of the work which Myas was doing, that this fit of disgust of my own life came on me. I got tired of taking so much care of such unimportant things. I got tired of hearing so much worthless talk and of contributing my share to the sum of it. For an hour or two I was busy with telegrams and telephone, and by that time my man had packed my things, and the cab was ready to take me to Paddington. I did not, of course, let my friends know where I had gone. The cottage was my harmless secret. If I let my friends know, they would probably wish to come down and cheer me up and that would be too depressing. I said that I was going to Paris. I took with me two books, or rather pamphlets, which were all that Daniel Myas had so far published. The first of these was entitled, A Clinical Study of the Physical and Psychical Phenomena of Somatic Dissolution. Myas had often laughed at scientific jargon, but he admitted that he was a master in the use of it himself. This work had appeared originally in the American Journal of Abnormal Psychology and had attracted some little attention. The Lancet had dealt dutifully but severely with it. Much of it was simply Greek to me. I was never taught any science at school, and I did not know what a good deal of the jargon meant but there were passages in it, notably where he summed up his conclusions in more popular language, which were wildly interesting. The other pamphlet had been privately printed since his arrival in England. It was called Experimental Observations on the Continuity of the Ego. I got on better with this. It was a most amazing little pamphlet. It was science plus religion and religion plus poetry. As any reader must have gathered, I am not much of an author myself, but I have read a good deal, and I think I do know good writing when I see it. I read that pamphlet more than once, and it increased my respect for Myas's abilities. I had a week of the most delightful quiet at my cottage. I did a good deal of gardening under the direction of old Wellsford. 
he is rather severe with me, and I think I like it. At any rate, it makes a pleasant change from the cat-like obsequiousness of my man in town. Wellsford is a great nature student, too, and tells me and shows me much that is interesting. Everything in the garden has for him a distinct personality, and he speaks of flowers and vegetables very much as he would speak of human beings. I have heard him accuse potatoes of being obstinate. At about eleven one morning, as I was working in the garden, a telegram was brought out to me, which had been forwarded on from St. James's place. It was signed, Laid, and there was nothing to tell me whether the mother or the daughter had sent it. It said, Please come here at once. I hesitated for a moment. I thought of telegraphing for further particulars but the message seemed so urgent that I decided not to waste time on that. I sent Wellsford to get the car out and hurried indoors to change my clothes. There was an express that I should just be able to catch. I drove myself and left the car in a garage near the station. Shortly after four I was in London. I went first to a telephone office to tell my people at St. James's Place to expect me that evening, and then, as I had my latch key with me, I drove to the entrance in Durnford Place. My taxicab could not get quite up to the door, as a dog cart was standing there. It was a seedy-looking dog cart, and apparently had not been washed for a week. A wretched old horse stood dejectedly in the shafts. At the horse's head was a groom in dusty and ill-fitting livery. He was eating nuts, and he stared at me curiously, as if he wondered what I was doing there. Durnford Place was very quiet that afternoon, and the crack of the nutshells rang out loudly. I was just about to pay my cabman when it occurred to me that, after all, he might perhaps be useful. I told him to wait. At this moment the garden door opened, and Mr. Valsame came out. He was drawing a pair of excessively ugly yellow gloves on to his fat hands. He had changed, if anything, for the worse since the night I met him first. His clothes were shabby, and he looked unwashed and unkempt. His expression was grave and troubled. He spoke to me at once without offering to shake hands. "'So you've come at last, Mr. Compton?' "'I came as soon as I got the telegram. It was forwarded to me from London. I was away in Gloucestershire.' "'I see,' he said. "'Well, I suppose I had better go in with you.' "'Can you tell me what is the matter, Mr. Volsame?' "'Matter? I thought you knew. They should have told you in the telegram.' Daniel Myas is dead. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of an Exchange of Souls by Barry Payne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Inside the garden I paused for a moment. "'It seems almost incredible,' I said. "'A few days ago when I left him he seemed in the best of health. "'When did he die?' "'I was telephoned for at a quarter to eight this morning "'and was here by eight. "'So far as I can tell, death must have occurred at least six hours previously.' "'And the cause of death?' "'The direct cause was failure of respiration under an anesthetic.' The anesthetic was chloride of ethyl, and it was automatically administered. It was in his workroom there that he died. I gave notice to the coroner at once, of course. It will be for the inquest to settle whether the death was accidental or not. I did not much like the man's tone. It was at once truculent and suspicious. Dr. Myas was about the last man in the world to commit suicide, 
I said. I didn't say suicide. There's a sealed letter waiting for you up at the house. You would probably prefer to open it in the presence of the police and to show them what it contains. Very well, I said. And what about Miss Laid? I haven't seen her. In fact, she won't see me. Well, I can understand that. She is shut up in her room alone, and I don't for a moment suppose that she will consent to see you either, Mr. Compton. I don't want to bother her, I said. It is all perfectly natural. She was devoted to Myas, and this must be a terrible shock to her. Possibly. It may be so. Do you by any chance happen to know the terms of the will? I do. Why? Oh, nothing. Mrs. Lade knew them. I have had that definitely from her own lips, so presumably her daughter knew them too. I don't see what bearing that has on the question. Don't you? sneered Mr. Vulsame. Perhaps you will see it at the inquest. It is a point which will probably be raised. You seem to be singularly innocent for a man of your years. I loathed the fellow, and I was getting more and more angry with him. Wouldn't it save trouble, I said, if you were to say quite plainly what you mean, or are you afraid to say it? What is it you are trying to insinuate? I am afraid of nothing, and I am not trying to insinuate anything. Perhaps everything is all right. There is no doubt whatever that Myas made frequent experiments upon himself. He had also experimented with Miss Laid. I found a record of many of the experiments, and I tell you frankly, I cannot see for what purpose they were conducted. He jerked his thumb in the direction of the workroom. I should say he had every known variety of anesthetic in there, and some very neat apparatus for administering it. Clockwork can go wrong, and the medical man may make mistakes. That may have been the reason why, when already under the anesthetic, he received double the amount of the chloride of ethyl that he intended. In that case, I suppose the death would be considered accidental. I can't say. I have an open mind on the question. I felt instinctively that this man might do some mischief, and that it would not do to lose one's temper with him. I decided to handle him a little more carefully. I was told by Myas, I said, that I was to be his sole executor and trustee for Miss Lade. Myas was a great friend of mine. You see, I am very deeply interested in this and I hope you will help me get to the bottom of it. Could you perhaps spare me an hour or so at St. James's place, if you are not too busy? Busy? he said savagely. Plucky lot of business Myas left me. Well, he's dead. I'll say no more about that just now. Yes, I can come if you like. Thank you very much. Perhaps you would like to send your cart away. I've got a taxi there, and I don't suppose that I shall keep you waiting more than a few minutes. All right, said Valsame. There's the inspector if you want him. A friendly-looking man in plain clothes had just come out of the workroom, locking the door behind him. I introduced myself to him. This is a terrible business, I said. Have you any idea how it happened? That's not for me to say, sir, said the inspector. Not at present, at any rate. I'm just collecting the facts. So far as I have gone, I have found no motive for suicide, and it is quite possible that the death was accidental. I have been looking at the apparatus in there, and it's easy to see how a mistake could be made. It's a clockwork thing actuating a little pump. You can set it to deliver this anesthetic stuff once and then stop, or twice and then stop, or any number of times. 
he was playing a very dangerous game, and there is the evidence in his own writing that he had played it often before. I suppose he was studying the nature of these different anesthetics. However, something else may turn up yet. Mr. Vulsame will have told you that there is a sealed letter waiting for you. He did. Well, we haven't been into that yet. Would it be convenient? Quite. If you will come on up to the house, we can open it now. We went up the iron steps, and Mrs. Lade's servant admitted us. She was a young girl, very frightened, stupid, and tearful. Somehow it seemed strange to stand there in Myas's rooms and to know that he would never enter them again. What had become of his proud boast to me that he would demonstrate to me personally the existence of a human soul? The news of his death had been an unexpected shock to me, but I felt the necessity to put personal feelings aside and to keep very keenly on the alert. It was obvious that Mr. Valsame meant mischief, and I had promised Myas, in the event of his death, to do the best I could for Miss Lade. The letter contained Myas's will, properly executed, and a short note for myself. The note merely said that Myas was engaged in a line of research which presented certain risks, and that if anything happened to him, he wanted to take that opportunity of thanking me for my great kindness to him in the past, and for my promise to look after Alice for the future. "'Had he any near relations?' asked the inspector. "'I see he leaves this girl everything.' "'No, he had no near relations. He has told me so more than once.' "'I see,' said the inspector. He made a few notes, including one of my name and address, and then left. I saw Mrs. Lade for a few minutes. The poor woman was rather incoherent. It was clear that she regarded the presence of any policeman on the premises as a disgrace, and an inquest as a stain on her own personal honor. On these points I did my best to console her. Of Myas she spoke with great enthusiasm. "'A better and a kinder man no one could wish to see, if only he could have been kept from messing with chemicals, as I often told him. And now I must look forward to seeing Alice go the same way, she being of age and with a will of her own. "'How is she?' "'Seems like a person dazed.' She is alone in her room, and been there the best part of the day, and perhaps it's as well. But, oh, she's quite strange to me. How do you mean, Mrs. Lade? Well, not like my daughter. That's the bitterness of it. It's no fault of hers, mind. It's just this education that's done it. I often think that girls nowadays would be happier without it. What did you mean when you said that you must look forward to Alice going the same way? Well, she has told me already that the work must go on, and when she is once determined on a thing there is no moving her. But to my mind it is simply disregarding the warning that God has given us. Of course, she may still think better of it. We can but hope. It was true, as Vulsame had told me, that she knew the terms of the will, and that Alice was now comparatively a wealthy woman. I will do her the justice to say this did not seem to affect Mrs. Lade in the least, except in so far as it removed the terror of funeral expenses. By which so many have been crippled, she added feelingly. The money will be little good to Alice, she said, for she will never marry now. There never was but one man in the world for her, and that was Dr. Myas. I was entirely of her opinion. I left word for her that Miss Lade should see me at any time. She had only to send a telephone message, and I would come at once. 
I now went back to Vulsame. I found him seated in my taxicab, and smoking one of the very worst cigars I have ever had the misfortune to smell. "'You've kept me waiting a hell of a time,' he said angrily. "'Sorry,' I said. I persuaded him not to talk to me in the cab, on the grounds that the traffic made it difficult for one to hear, and while he remained silent I could think over the situation and make my plans. I studied his physiognomy very carefully. It struck me that, if necessary, Mr. Vulsame would probably be purchasable as a moderate figure, provided, of course, that he was allowed to save his face. At St. James's place he watched me as I paid the cabman. "'My word,' he said, "'you toffs don't think much about keeping them waiting, ticking up two pences all the time. But it runs up, doesn't it?' "'Yes,' I said, "'it runs up.' "'But I suppose,' he added tactfully, "'you take that out of the estate.' He accepted with alacrity the offer of a whiskey and soda. "'I don't mind admitting,' he said, "'that I'm simply parched. A thing like this knocks one over a bit, too, though of course I'm a doctor and used to it. I can tell you it wasn't a very pretty sight when I went into that laboratory early this morning.' I had the whiskey left by Mr. Valsame for purposes of reference. The more talkative he was, the better he would suit my purpose. I told him that I should be glad to have his opinion on some cigars of mine. I struck a match and handed it to him. In fact, I waited on the beast. For a moment or two, he jabbered nonsense about the cigars, and then I struck in. There was one thing you told me this morning, Mr. Valsame, that surprises me very much. Ah, said Mr. Vulsame complacently, I dare say. I've surprised a good many people in my time. What was it? Well, I don't see how poor Myas can possibly have interfered with your practice. I should have thought that was quite secure. Myas always spoke of you as an able man. For that matter, I could see as much for myself. If I may say so, I am sure your genial manners would make you popular in Fulham or anywhere else. I was sorry as well as surprised to hear the business was not very good with you. The competition is pretty keen everywhere, he said. It doesn't take so very much to put a man wrong. What I have told you is quite correct, and my books will show it. If you doubt my word, you can see them. "'But, my dear fellow, why on earth should I doubt your word?' "'Very well, then. I suppose you know the lines Myas was working on. I did permit him to make certain observations and carry out certain experiments with patients of mine. It was all quite legitimate, mind you, or I wouldn't have allowed it. Not for a moment. But it got talked about, and, of course, it got exaggerated.' and it did me a deal of harm. By the way, do give yourself another drink, Mr. Valsame. And it is solely to this that you assign the falling off in your practice? Solely. I'm as good as ever I was. Better. He took the other drink. Well, I said, this, of course, is a thing which ought to be looked into. If it's not too delicate a question, did Dr. Myas make you any payment for these important services that you seem to have rendered him? If you can call it payment. Oh, I didn't want to know the exact amount. That, of course, I shall get later, because, as his executor, I shall have his bank book in my hands. I wished to spare Mr. Valsame the humiliation of telling lies, which would afterwards be discovered. "'Quite so,' said Mr. Valsame. "'I knew that. Well, as a matter of fact, he did pay me what was agreed upon between us, 
before I knew what the results would be. It is the result that makes all the difference. What we've got to look at is the injury to the capital value of my practice. You understand what I mean by capital value? Quite so. I thought you would. If he had left me in his will a matter of two hundred or, say, three hundred pounds, I should never have said a word about this to anybody. But I understand that I'm not so much as mentioned. You are not. And you consider that you have really a moral claim against his estate? Moral claim. You've hit the phrase exactly. Then, of course, it becomes my duty to consider this. I must turn it over in my mind and see what ought to be done. Naturally, you wouldn't expect a decision offhand. Not at all. I'm a reasonable man. Your time is mine. And he took another drink. There's one other point, I said. What is your real opinion about the death of Myas? Between ourselves? Quite. The thing's as clear as mud. It was murder. And either the old woman or Miss Lade did it, although most certainly it was Miss Lade. This, I said, is very interesting. I was pretty certain that it was not a case of murder. I was absolutely certain that, if it was murder, neither Mrs. Lade nor her daughter had anything to do with it. But I did not want any suspicion of Miss Lade to be stated publicly. These things cling to one and do harm, even when the suspicions are shown to be baseless. There is always some idiot who has read half the newspaper report of a sixteenth of the evidence and thinks himself justified in expressing his wonder afterwards whether there was anything in it. There are some offenses of which the mere accusation is enough to produce something like ruin. My interview with Mr. Valsame began to be, as I had frankly told him, very interesting. End of chapter 8